Hi, this is just a little catch-up video. A main logical skill is to be able to look at a passage, a written passage, and be able to tell if there's an argument there and what the argument is. To know what the argument is, you have to know what the premises are and the conclusion. That's all that an argument is, a bunch of premises and the conclusion. So how do you figure out of all the statements in the passage, which ones are the premises and which is the conclusion. One thing that can help a lot are indicator words. Conclusion indicator words and premise indicator words. This slide gives a good supply of them. You should be able to recognize them all. Many of the quizzes concern exactly these. You have to recognize them and you have to make use of them. Here's how you make use of them. Indicator words or phrases indicate what comes right after them, the proposition that comes to the right of the indicator phrase. What we have here is standard form in simplified form. These are the instructions you need to follow when I ask you to put an argument into standard form. You write out the premises, which are like the reasons and the evidence given for a claim, in a numbered list. And then you draw a horizontal line write down the letter C under the line, and then the conclusion of the argument. A main task we'll have in the beginning is making sure we have all the premises. When people make arguments, sometimes they leave premises out. To understand, analyze, and evaluate their arguments, we need to make sure that we supply all the missing premises. You can see here two simple examples of arguments in standard forms. Yours should look a little bit like that. One sentence per line. Now standard form is a little complicated. By my reckoning, there are 11 steps you need to follow. These include not just standard form, but how to evaluate the argument as well. We can't go over all of them now, but we're going to get started with the first ones so that we formulate each argument as completely as possible before we begin the evaluation. Make sure the premises are written in a numbered list, one premise per numbered line. Make sure the conclusion is below the list of premises, separated by a line and marked with the letter C. In standard form, there are no premise indicators or conclusion indicators. Or rather, that long list of premise indicators and conclusion indicators in English that I gave you are to be avoided in standard form. You use the information those indicators give you to tell you which statements go where in standard form. In other words, which statements are premises and which is the conclusion. But once you've used the premise or conclusion indicator words to determine what is the premise and what is the conclusion, you don't need them anymore. You only write out the propositions themselves in the appropriate place in standard form. In effect, the numbers are premise indicators. They indicate that there's a premise there, and the letter C indicates the conclusion. So you don't need the regular premise and conclusion indicators in standard form, because standard form comes with its own. Here's another important rule we can follow right away. Each premise has to be a single proposition. It has to be a single truth claim, not more than one truth claim, not less than a single truth claim. For example, not only part of an if-then sentence, the if part or the then part. For now, the sentences will be fairly simple, but you have to make sure that a single proposition or assertion is being made. And what I've just said about all the premises also applies to the conclusion. The conclusion of a single argument must be a single proposition. Now there are a few more rules in this checklist to make sure we've got standard form complete but we'll be going over those in detail in later lectures. For now, I'll just mention that it's important not just that there be a single proposition in each premise, but that it be a complete proposition and an independent proposition, one that stands on its own. So for that reason, we tend to get rid of pronouns if we can, replace them by the nouns that they stand for. And we try to supply any missing words if they're implied but not stated.
In other words, there aren't just missing premises, parts of premises go missing. When you're writing out arguments in standard form, it's important to get the argument complete, to make sure all of the premises are complete sentences, complete propositions. So you can see how they're all linked together and how they support the conclusion. Items five and six on the checklist are also important for standard form, but we have special exercises looking into them later. The remaining items in the checklist are really very important, but they're about evaluating the argument. We'll look at evaluating arguments later, but it's bound to come up right at the start. Making sure your arguments follow checklist items 7, 8, and 9 is about making sure the argument is well connected, that all the premises are properly connected to each other and to the conclusion. These items will see a lot of work when we're trying to fill in missing premises. The last criteria are also about the arguments being a good one. Of course, the premises need to be true and they need to somehow force the conclusion to be true or at least to be likely to be true. But again, these points of evaluation will come up in more detail later. For right now, I want you to do the following exercise. Here's an argument written out in ordinary English, as you might find it written out somewhere in a magazine or in a newspaper, perhaps in a science journal. Your task is to write this out in standard form. I'll give you a few hints along the way to make it easier. Here's a second argument you can also try. You might want to pause the video here and try to write these arguments out in standard form as best you can, then continue on with the hints I give you next. Here's that first argument again. This time I've highlighted a single word, the word because. It's an important premise indicator, and it's also importantly ambiguous. Whenever you see the word because, you can't be sure that it's an argument. The word because is also used in explanations, and arguments and explanations are different in important ways that we take up very soon in this course. But in this case, I've already told you, this is an argument. So the word because here is very likely to be a premise indicator. That means that the sentence to the right of it is the premise. It also means the sentence to the left of it is probably the conclusion. If you look closely, you see there's still another sentence in this paragraph, the first sentence. What role does it play? Well, you've already got a conclusion, so it's likely to be the premise. In other words, as written, the first sentence is a premise, the second sentence in the middle is a conclusion, and the final sentence is a premise again. It's like a conclusion sandwich. But in standard form, the conclusion is always moved to the end. And the word because will not appear. The order of the two premises doesn't really matter. But sometimes they seem to read better in one order than another. You decide. Here's the second example. This time I've removed some words and also the punctuation mark. An important rule, which is in the checklist if you check, is that each sentence in standard form must be a statement, can't be a question or a command. Grammatically speaking, it's got to be an assertion, what the textbook calls a declarative sentence, not a grammatical question or a command with an exclamation mark. Those aren't allowed in standard form. Standard form is the standard form of arguments. Arguments move from truth to truth, at least the good ones. The premises, like input, need to be the sort of thing that can be either true or false. And in good arguments, they will be true. The words, of course, are not needed here. They're like a commentary on the sentence itself. They don't add to the content, they add a kind of an attitude. The speaker thinks it's obvious that lecture halls ought to be wheelchair accessible, and they think you should think it's obvious too. But that attitude isn't part of the argument. Focus on the statements themselves that are given, the individual propositions or truth claims. The second sentence is interesting. It's the form of a question. In standard form, you can't use questions, but sometimes we use questions in order to make statements. In this case, 
The person is not using this question to raise a question. It's not like they don't know the answer. They know perfectly well what they're talking about, and they think you should too. So really what they're doing with this grammatical question is they're making an assertion. The use of their words is not the typical use of the words, but it is pretty common. It's called a rhetorical question. There can't be any questions in standard form. There must be assertions. If someone uses a rhetorical question to make an assertion, it's your job, analyzing the argument, to make sure you put the assertion in standard form and not the question itself. But now we're facing a little problem. What we've got left here are two assertions. A first assertion and the second assertion. How do we know which one is the premise and which one's the conclusion? You might not have even known it's an argument if I hadn't told you. But it is an argument. So how do you determine which one's the premise and which is the conclusion? Especially given the fact that there are no premise indicator words here. There are no conclusion indicator words. So it could be either way. What do you think? Is the first sentence the premise? And the second sentence the conclusion? Or is it the other way around? Is the first sentence the conclusion? And the second sentence the reason given for it? How can you tell? One way to tell is just to write them out with a little bit of space between them and consider two different words in between. You imagine the words in there and see which one really fits. You imagine premise indicators or conclusion indicators in there to see if one of them makes sense. Now if you try the word therefore between these two sentences, perhaps someone wants to argue that students in wheelchairs have a right to attend classes and they give the reason that lecture halls ought to be wheelchair accessible. Well, when you think about it, that doesn't make very much sense. The word therefore between those two sentences is not very clear at all. Now, if you try the word because between these two sentences, there's a little bit of a ring, a click perhaps. Lecture halls ought to be wheelchair accessible because students in wheelchairs have a right to attend classes like everyone else. There's a missing premise, something that connects attending classes like everyone else with lecture halls being wheelchair accessible. There's a number of assumptions there. Some very vividly come to the fore, like that the lectures are taking place in a classroom, which they aren't today. <laughs> so, but it's an assumption of this argument. It's not stated. It would have to be stated in standard form to write it out fully. So this is how you use the premise indicators and conclusion indicators to get a passage into standard form. First, you check if the passage has any premise indicators or conclusion indicators. And if you know or you can figure out that it's an argument, you can make use of those to determine what the conclusion is and which other propositions are there that may be the premises. But when there are no premise or conclusion indicators, you can imagine them in place and see what sense can be made and what sense isn't made. In this way, you can figure out what's a premise and what's a conclusion, even when there are no indicator words given. So in the first exercise, you were asked to write out two arguments in standard form, to take them from regular English prose to some kind of standardized way of representing arguments, premises in a numbered list, separated from the conclusion below them by a horizontal line. Now I want you to do the same thing with the following arguments. If you've done some of these in class before, you don't need to do them again. But each one of these should be written up as essentially a two-premise argument, following the rules on the checklist. Close inspection of these exercises shows that each one of them is composed of two component propositions or sentences, assertions that are being made. You need to use premise or conclusion indicators, whether or not they're present, to determine which of the sentences represents the premise and which sentence or sentence part represents the conclusion. Just doing that, you'll end up with one-premise arguments. But one-premise arguments are almost always faulty and problematic. 
In each of these cases, there's an unstated premise. You can say a premise has gone missing. It's implicit. It hasn't been said. Standard form won't allow any hidden premises. In ordinary conversation, we often make arguments that are incomplete. We leave out premises, perhaps taking them for granted, thinking the other person agrees. You can think of these as said in some conversation somewhere. Something's left out. In standard form, you need to provide that all. So in each case, write the conclusion below a horizontal line and write the given premise as premise number one. In the second spot, try to find a missing premise. In most cases, you'll be able to guess pretty easily what the missing premise is. But filling in missing premises can get to be quite an intricate matter. In a future lecture, I'll go over each one of these examples in painstaking detail and show you all the ins and outs, the possible loopholes and potholes that you can get into when you're trying to fill in missing premises. Along the way, what we'll really be learning is the 11-point checklist. So review that one more time. Complete these arguments, put them all into standard form, and watch for the next video where I go through them more carefully. Thanks.